Have you ever looked at a world map and noticed something strange about religion? Specifically, why Christianity became so popular in West Africa during British rule, but didn't catch on near as much in other former British colonies like India and Pakistan? At first glance, you might think, well, maybe the British just didn't try to spread Christianity in India. But that's not the case at all. In fact, there were numerous attempts to convert the subcontinent. So why did it work in one place, but not the other? To understand this, we need to take a dive into colonial history, religious fervor, and the delicate dance of power between the colonizers and the colonized. Let's start with a quote that really sets the stage. Lord Salisbury, who served as British Prime Minister three times between 1885 and 1902, once said, <clears throat> A missionary is a religious Englishman with a mission to offend the religious feelings of the natives. Ouch. That's pretty harsh. Especially coming from the head of government that was sending these missionaries out. But it tells us something crucial. Even at the highest level of British leadership, there were still doubts about the role and impact of missionaries in their colonies. It suggests that the relationship between imperialism and religion wasn't always good, and sometimes it was downright contentious. Now let's go back a bit. The late 18th and early 19th centuries were a turning point moment for the missionary activity in the British Empire. After the 1790s, a wave of missionary societies popped up, each eager to send spiritual messengers to non-Christian lands. It was like a spiritual startup boom, with each organization competing to save the most souls. But why this sudden surge in Christian interest? A lot of it had to do with Britain's long, grueling war against Napoleonic France from 1793 to 1815. This wasn't just any conflict, it was existential. Britain was fighting for its very survival and the strain was felt throughout society. When they finally emerged victorious in 1815, after the defeat of Napoleon and Waterloo, many Brits saw it as divine intervention. So, fresh off this massive win, the British had a sort of, you know, national ego boost. They thought, um, God's on our side, and he wants us to spread the word. This coincided with Europe's increased access to new territories, India, China, the Pacific, and the interiors of West and South Africa. It was as if the whole world was opening up just as Britain was feeling this spiritual calling. In West Africa, missionaries weren't just welcomed, they were often seen as a better alternative to other forms of European contact. Now you might be wondering, why were these West African rulers so cool with missionaries? Great question. It wasn't just about spiritual enlightenment. For many local leaders, converting to Christianity was a strategic move. They knew that by accepting a missionary's guidance, they were effectively sending an invitation to the British for further state building support. But, and this is key, these rulers were no pushovers. They saw missionaries as a way to get external contacts, skills, information, and trade opportunities without giving up control. Many of them actually disliked the idea of territorial conquest. So, when they showed up unarmed and preaching peace, it signaled to the local communities that they weren't the swords of the British battalion. In a way, welcoming these missionaries was like getting a free trial of British culture without having to buy the full militaristic package. Now let's hop over to India and see why this success story didn't replay itself there. You'd think that with the British East India Company controlling huge swaths of the subcontinent, missionaries would have had a field day. After all, more territory should mean more souls to save, right? But it didn't work out that way. And the reasons are fascinating. But before that, let's go way back. India's Christian history goes way, way back. Long before the British Empire was even a twinkle in anyone's eye. It's the first century AD. The Roman Empire is at its height. In Judea, a Jewish preacher named Jesus has just been crucified, but his followers are spreading his message far and wide. Enter Thomas, often called Doubting Thomas because of his initial skepticism about Jesus' resurrection. According to early Christian traditions, he set his sights eastward, all the way to India. The Indian subcontinent wasn't some isolated, unknown land back then. Far from it, India was a major player in the ancient world's trade networks. According to tradition, Thomas landed at Cranganor on the Malabar coast in 52 AD. According to the Acts of Thomas, 
an early Christian text, he converted several members of the local royal families. Now, fast forward again to the late 15th and 16th centuries. The Portuguese arrive in India, establishing a colony in Goa. They are shocked to find Christians already there. So, by the time the British start seriously expanding into India in the 18th and 19th centuries, Christianity is already nearly 1,700 years old on the subcontinent. It's not some foreign import. It's as Indian as chai tea, and this deep-rooted history actually complicates the British missionary efforts we were discussing earlier. When British missionaries tried to spread their version of Christianity, they weren't just competing with Hinduism and Islam. They were also up against an ancient, indigenized form of Christianity that had adapted to Indian culture over nearly two millennia. Now let's come to the question of why Christianity could not take root during the British period in India. First off, the East India Company was initially dead set against letting missionaries into their territories. This wasn't because they were secular or anti-religious. Far from it. They were worried that missionary activity would stir up trouble in a land with hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of devout followers of other faiths. The company bigwigs feared that if local elites and the general population suspected the British were trying to impose Christianity, it could destabilize their rule. Before the Sepoy Mutiny of 1857 to 1859, which led to direct rule from London, the East India Company actively discouraged missionaries. They were acutely aware of how few British personnel there were compared to the population. Their security hinged on collaboration mainly with Hindu native soldiers. And this partnership relied on the company's promises not to mess with religious and social status quo. But the missionaries weren't about to give up. In the 1830s, they made a savvy move. Realizing that direct preaching was a hard sell, they instead threw their support behind the implementation of English education throughout India. Their reasoning? If they couldn't convert students directly, they could at least expose them to Christian values through schooling. The strategy paid off, at least in terms of numbers. By the 1850s, the Bengal presidency alone had 22 missionary schools with about 6,000 students. Compare that to the 31 government-run public schools, which only had 4,241 pupils. Zoom out to all of India, missionary schools had 101,192 pupils, while government schools had just 23,163. Impressive, right? These numbers, while big, don't tell the whole story. The missionaries often complained that most of their students and converts came from India's lower castes, groups that played little role in the colony's economic or political landscape. Very few, if any, high-caste Brahmins or Rajputs showed interest in Christianity. Even in the bustling city of Bombay in 1852, with its population of 500,000 Hindus, there were only 294 Christians. In total, the best estimates suggest there were just 90,000 Christians across the entire subcontinent. That's a drop in the ocean compared to the Muslim and Hindu populations. So despite their educational inroads, missionaries weren't seeing the mass conversions they'd hoped for. They did have a bit more success in the late 1800s, though. By then, missionaries had switched gears again. Instead of targeting the masses, they focused on presenting religion as a perk that came with high-class education. This approach appealed to more elite castes. Take St. Stephen's College in Delhi, for example. Modeled on a Cambridge college, it attracted higher caste Indians. But here's the interesting part. The missionaries didn't push for outright conversion. They knew that that would scare students away. The hope was that by gradually infusing the Indian elite with Christian values, they'd open up the door for top-down conversion. It was a long game. Soften the cultural ground now, reap the spiritual harvest later. But it had its drawbacks. By tying Christianity so closely to British education, they made it harder for an independent, self-sustaining Indian Christian community to emerge. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, weren't there any significant British settlements in India at all? The answer is yes. But the nature and scale of these settlements was vastly different from what we see in places like North America, New Zealand, or Australia. In those regions, the goal was literal settler colonialism, claiming land by moving European settlers en masse to demographically overwhelm the indigenous populations. Governments actively encouraged entire families to migrate. 
This wasn't just about taking land by force. It was about maintaining that claim by populating the area with white, European settlers. Some say that the lands in North America or Australia were relatively empty or underdeveloped, making them ripe for settlement. But be careful with that narrative. It was often used as justification for seizing land. In reality, many of these areas, like the Great Plains of North America, were supporting the maximum population they could ecologically sustain. Adding more people eventually led to problems like soil exhaustion or overgrazing. Now, contrast this with British India. The initial imperial ambitions there weren't about settling the land, but controlling and extracting wealth from the existing population. In the early days, under the East India Company, British employees lived in forts near sea routes and harbors, not on farms or in homes. These men saw their time in India as temporary service. They were almost all male, lived in military-style housing, and were discouraged from marrying Indian women. The East India Company also had a monopoly on British trade in the region until the early 1800s. This meant that other British traders couldn't just migrate there to try their luck without the company's blessing. So the conditions that encouraged settlement and chain migration in the Americas just weren't present in India. Things shifted a bit after 1857 or 58, when the British government took direct control from the East India Company. India became the jewel and the crown of the empire, and this led to more British migration. Some came to staff the expanded imperial bureaucracy, others to seize the new commercial opportunities now that the company's monopoly was gone. India was seen as a land of established industries, textiles, agriculture, you name it, unlike the wild or uncultivated image of the Americas. From the mid-1800s through independence, there were growing communities of Anglo-Indians across the colony, mostly living in enclaves and identifying as permanent settlers. Most significantly, India had a strong anti-imperial nationalist movement that achieved independence in 1947. The post-independence period wasn't the most comfortable for British migrants. Many returned to Britain or moved on to other imperial territories. 